So yeah, it's good actually, now you've said that about the kind of pattern also of the secret diary of a CEO, because I look back and I noticed there was a little period of time where there were quite a lot of ones with sex experts, so now I know what you were going through, and then it suddenly changed to diet experts as well, so I can probably, I can probably write some of your secret diary based on that. Um, let's have a look at the book as well, because this, this book, we should say, so it's about, a lot of this is about switching isn't it? And explain what you mean by, by, by switching. We've got, I think somewhere here, I'll find it. There was one we were talking about. I, I mean, I mentioned aubergine parmigiana, but there's a, a aubergine schnitzel, for instance, here. So the aubergine schnitzel. So what yeah. is going on in that recipe? Okay, well, this book really is a practical guide to how to use the advice in Food for Life, the sort of science, in a really easy, practical terms with these six general principles of how to, how to you know, transform your diet based on science. So eating 30 plants a week, uh, eating the rainbow, um, pivoting your protein so you have less meat, more pulses, and you, you focus on fiber, not protein, uh, eating more fermented foods, um, thinking, uh, think about quality, not calories, so cutting out UPF, and finally, giving your gut a rest. So having sort of flexible meal times so that we don't have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you can have any of these whenever you want. So they're the principles behind this. And then the idea was to take dishes that you could add all these things to. So you could always add more fermented foods to it. You could uh, do some nice swaps that you would otherwise not think about. So um, many of the dishes have beans instead of rice. So where you'd have white rice on a base, now we've swapped it for, you, you mash up some beans, you have a bean mash uh, with maybe some you know, ferments in it. And that, that's a really nice way of cutting out the sugar, adding in protein and fiber, and it's even tastier than, you know, than rice or mashed potato. And then dishes like this, I've got aubergine schnitzel. I used to work in a kitchen uh, when I was 18 in Austria doing the washing up, up a mountain. Um, and I basically couldn't bear to throw away these Wiener schnitzels as they came back to me uh, from the tables, untouched. They were Wiener schnitzel cordon bleus. Anyone know what they are? So it's like a veal, and then you've got a layer of ham, and then cheese, and it's all covered in breadcrumbs. It's incredibly filling, and I used to eat them all. And um, scavenger. I was, uh, wait, you had to otherwise throw them away in the bin. I couldn't do it. And so I put on about a stone in about um, two months, I think it was, um, from being Mr. Skinny to suddenly I came back Mr. Chubby Cheeks. And I wanted to recreate this, and we did it basically getting rid of the veal, putting aubergines instead of it. Instead of the um, breadcrumbs, we put a nut crumb on top of it, so you're getting the nuts and the polyphenols, and we've got uh, sauerkraut, which, uh, so we're getting a fermented food in there, and we've got a bed of hummus, again, rather than potatoes, so you're making all these swaps, and of course, you've got plenty of, you know, it still feels good, you've got an egg in there, you've got harissa to make it spicy, and you can top it up with kimchi and lots of cheese, so it's still a really heartwarming comfort food, but we've just switched things around. And this is the general basis of this book, is that you know, they're beautiful looking, beautiful tasting meals that you can spice up and make them both healthier and tastier using the, these key principles. That does seem, what you just mentioned comfort food there, and that seems to me to be one of the battles there, which is there are certain foods, very often which are very unhealthy, but which do have a connection, say, to our childhood, say to my, so finding that way of creating something that still gives that psychological comfort that comes from it. Uh, very important, because I think what you don't want to do is create tell trans, you know, cookbooks that are all about low calorie and low fat, and it's about punishment and a little bit of lettuce leaf, and you've got these tiny portions, okay. you know, uh, and they've only got kale and, you know, no donuts. And you say, well, how can you do that for more than a couple of weeks? You know, it's not, it, you know, you might say, well, this is aspirational as well, I do, but you're not going to do this. So everything 
I'm trying to do, everything Zoe's trying to do, is to change people's habits for not just weeks, not just years, but decades, and actually just move them along this journey and realize you can have super comfort food that can be healthy with all this stuff, your gut microbes, you can make it yourself, you, can, you don't have to you know, choose between it being you know, delicious or healthy. You know? I think that's really where, this is the sweet spot, I think, and this is where I'm very happy we've done this. There was a lasagna dish, and lasagna is one of my favorite dishes. My mum used to make it, she was a terrible cook, generally, no offense, mum. You know, she could burn peas. <laughs> um, but she, she was a keen Italian fan. She'd gone around Italy on a Vespa when she was in, in the 1950s, which was quite racy in those days. And, but she could make a mean lasagna. She always slightly burnt it. And it was always in that crispy bits on the top that I used to really adore, the, the burnt mm. cheese. So I wanted that flavor, but I didn't want all the rest of it. So we swapped it out and we just put lentils and mushrooms in there instead of the meat. And it, instead of the bechamel sauce, we made a bean and soy sauce that was just super healthy and packed with fiber. And we even allowed the basic, you know, you've still got the, the pasta in there, but it still scores really well. So there are ways of transforming these so-called unhealthy style dishes and make them healthy in an intelligent way. So I think that's, that's why I, I, you know, I, I love all the stuff in here. And, you know, there's plenty of things that you might look and say, well, that doesn't look super healthy. And that's great. I want people to be thinking that. St Stephen, what is the comfort food that you most need, Tim, to find a way of making it healthy? Um, I'm a big fan of, like, Tagla Telecarbonara. But I think I'm, and this is a controversial one, because I know that I know your stance on people being gluten-free. I think I'm, I've got an intolerance to gluten. Oh, no. I knew he was <laughs> He thinks we're all bullshitters. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, so I, but then when Tim came on the podcast, I thought maybe actually it's not that. But when I have like pasta and those kinds of foods, I get quite gassy. Too much information. But, so I always just you know, self-diagnose myself as being like gluten intolerant or something. I like carrot cake as well. Waffles. Um, these kinds of things. But. There's lots of good gluten-free pastas, though. So, yeah. so you can have, you know... Um, a lot of these lentil pastas, and uh, they're really good, or spelt, which has less gluten in it, and things like this. So you don't have to give up some of these things that you like. Uh, I think that's the point. There are actually a good range of choices here. You don't have to start restricting your diet. You can say, okay, I'm going to make a version of that that is really nice. And I think that, that's really the, the important can I also ask about, in, in your previous book, you talk quite a lot about kind of uh, the, these plant-based meat alternatives and the ones that, where, where are we with those now in, in terms of the best ones, the best alternatives in terms of on, on all levels, you know, because sometimes you will hear about certain, uh, say, vegan or vegetarian alternatives where, in fact, the cost is still very great in terms of what it does for the planet, etc. Yeah, so the, the first version of these, like Impossible Burgers and Beyond Meat, these companies, you know, took off astronomically, and then in the last couple of years, their share prices sort of plummeted again, uh, because they really the, the first versions of these things. And people have said, well, actually, they're nearly as ultra-processed as the things they were trying to replace, because they were doing so hard to try and get uh, the plants to look and taste like meat, that they had to glue them together and use the same tricks of the food industry. And people reacted against that. They wanted something better and more natural that tasted the same. So I think we've got to realize that that's just the first bit of the journey and that actually they're still healthier than eating the ultra-processed meat version, better for the planet, better for sustainability, uh, and they also have fiber in it, which, you know, normal burgers don't. But I think we're going to be seeing many more of these really natural versions of these. I've tasted some really good prototypes of burgers that you can't tell are made of plant, and there's no ultra-processed chemicals in them. So we, some of them are fermented vegetables. that gives them the umami tastes, and we're seeing much more use of mushrooms. You're probably seeing lots of companies that are, you know, dealing with uh, things like n these new fungal um, stuff. And uh, you know, uh, you're a big fan of magic mushrooms, aren't you? <laughs> um, My partner is. 
Uh, uh, but the, the point is, I think we're on the edge of a revolution here, not only in the fermented plants, but also precision fermentation, so you can actually produce some of these proteins from bacteria. Half of the um, egg whites uh, made in the US now are made by bacteria in, in like brewing tanks. So you can create albumin created by microbes. So we're, this is, these are proteins that are bioidentical, uh, made artificially. So we're gonna be seeing much more of this in our food system in the future. So we have to keep an open mind realize that the first versions were not that good, they pointed the way, and it's all gonna get much, much better. And, but I think we're gonna see more 50-50 meats, and um, I'm being told that within five years, there will be a patty that's sort of identical to the hamburger one that's cheaper than, um, than we have at the moment. And the price point will make a big difference, I think, to the whole market. People aren't at the moment prepared to pay more, mm. but they will, as soon as they see it's cheaper and healthier, then I think it's gonna shift this whole market. Okay. One more question, I'm then gonna throw it out to the audience, which is just, you know, a medical professional, an academic, and now sometimes you have to go into Prudleaf's kitchen and do some cooking. How do you, when you're suddenly in, in those situations, that must be a whole new kind of, tension and anxiety, surely. Yes, I was very worried about cutting my finger off live on TV, <laughs> uh, you know, sort of uh, with my poor knife skills. Um, but uh, yeah, I would never have dreamt five years ago that I would be doing cooking shows or even talk, up here talking about my cookbook. So uh, it's fun, but uh, you know, I think I'm enjoying every bit of it. And I think people, you know, like me, uh, so lucky that they have the chance to not get bored in any area and keep moving with the science and the times and talking about it. So, you know, I, I'm just incredibly lucky to uh, be given the opportunity. But if, you know, I think it's a lesson for anyone out there. You, you can reinvent yourself. You don't, and particularly professionals often get stuck in a rut. Uh, but that's, you're the doctor, you've got to stay there, you're the lawyer, you can't do that. But I think more and more in, in, in modern society, there's so much more you can get from, you know, going back to that Victorian era, being the polymath that does a bit of everything, because I think we need more multidisciplinary people around. I don't know what you think about that, Stephen. I, I, I couldn't agree, I couldn't agree more. Actually, um, I wrote a chapter in my book about the idea of resisting the labels, because most of us, um, and I, see, I understand why it's tempting, because you want to be understood. You're introduced, you have a bio. So most of us end up self-labeling ourselves with whatever we were successful at or known for last. And the problem with these labels is they, they form to let other people know who we are, but they also double up as an instruction manual for our future. So we then we play out, so if I'm social media CEO, and that's where I show up, that's the network I cultivate, that's what people expect of me, that's why people email me, that's why they call me. And you can get really down a, a, a path and sort of narrow your life in such a way which is not conducive with happiness because the reality of the situation is we're all multi-labeled. And I think you actually have to fight against that in the world we live in, you have to actually go out and, like for me, when I left my previous company and Matt was successful, so now I was social media CEO, I remember having the chat with myself being like, Remember you like music. Remember you like writing. Remember you really like that thing where you, you, you've done twice, which is interviewing people. Remember you're interested in psychedelics and fight back against your labels so that you can live a more um, challenging, more challenging life. And the reason I say challenging life is because once you become competent in something, it becomes less challenging. And when you look at game theory, the reason why games get increasingly more difficult, the reason why your crossword gets more difficult and it keeps you engaged is because it's, it's, it's a challenge. And so um, you've got to be wary of just of looking at your life and going, I'm actually here because I was good at something, not because this is who I am. I'm here now because I was good at passing those exams, not because this is who I am. And game theory, the idea of game theory and why games get increasingly harder has, has meant that I also pursue to try and design my life so I'm pursuing areas of where I have less competence. And that keeps your life exciting. I think if you want to enjoy when you wake up in the morning, you've got to, as Tim was saying, you've got to have that challenge, that sense of forward motion. You've got to be working with people you love, high autonomy. Um, and you've got to 
be pursuing something that's subjectively meaningful to you. Mm. And, and, and like people, thank you, mum. Uh, <laughs> Learning new things all yeah. the time. I think that's yeah. the thing, isn't it? That's exactly what I say about the challenge thing. Is you're like it, you've got to, you've got to have that in your life. And I think about it as an employer. Some of my team are here now, and in my head, I have this mental assessment, almost this mental score, like a Zoe score plug hashtag ad ASA. Um, I have this mental score of how challenged I think they are. And yet the first ring is like comfort zone, and then the second ring is maybe growth zone, and then the third ring is panic zone. So you want to keep them out of panic zone but they, they will quit their job if they're not in that discomfort zone. They will quit their job, they do, that's what happens. So when, as an employer, you're constantly trying to, okay, I think Grace is comfortable now, I'm gonna push her outside of her comfort zone. And, I've, and actually Grace and my team, who I don't even know if is here tonight, but she's been with me for, has been almost forever since the last couple of years, um, and it's because I've kept her outside of her zone of comfort. And it's the same thing that Tim was saying. He's, he's done that, reinvented himself, taken on greater challenges, written books, become a podcast, and now the fucking guy's a celebrity. So now he's just dealing with fan mail. So it's, you know. I think that's a very good point. I think it's one of those things which is one of the things we need to work harder and harder is also to give people permission to be something. Because I think, you know, depending on, you know, sex, gender, background, there's, there's a lot of people who think I'm not allowed to be this or I'm not allowed to be that. And that's part of it, I think, as well, which is to encourage people and say, you know, it, you're, you're allowed to be a poet, it's very you're hard. a screenwriter, it's you're allowed to be hard. a physicist. It's very hard for a doctor to do anything else because yeah. the other doctors all gang up on you and say, you can't do that. You can't, you know, you're, you're, you know, doctors aren't supposed to go on TV or do anything else. So I think there are some more really entrenched groups mm. that make it really difficult to, uh, to really exploit and, and get the most out of human potential. Because I think, you know, we all have phases of life that we're, we're good at that, those bits, but we just need much more flexibility in the workforce and our mentality, absolutely. To also, those doctors who do say that, you've already told us today, you've got new knife skills, so that should come in handy.